This video is going to offer an overview of the urinary system and its functions. Uh, and so uh, here's an amino acid. And uh, if this amino acid was something you ate for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and you'd like to use it for energy, uh, the way that uh, your cells do this is they remove the nitrogen uh, portion here, the amino group. Um, the problem is that this then potentially creates uh, ammonia. Uh, see, all amino acids are called amino acids because they have an amino group and an acid group. And if this amino group is uh, removed, it could form ammonia. And so thus, you could start to build ammonia up in your body just by digesting your food. That is toxic. Um, so the liver uh, helps you out uh, by converting uh, what would be uh, ammonia into uh, urea by taking two amino groups and joining it to a central carbon. Um, but still, this is uh, toxic and needs to be eliminated from your body. So when you digest your food, your body builds up uh, this toxic nitrogenous waste, and it must be removed. And so you spend, you send a considerable amount of your uh, blood to your kidneys. Uh, this can be at, you know, maybe 20%, maybe even close to 25% of the blood leaving your left ventricle at rest. So up to a quarter of the uh, blood leaving uh, your uh, vent left ventricle at rest is going to uh, your kidneys to remove this. Now, if you look, the kidneys uh, in that model of a human or here in this cat are not in the same cavity as the intestines. So they're not in the body cavity, they're behind it. Officially, the name for that is a retroperitoneal. Uh, they are held in place by adipose. So here you can see in the cat, there's a fat capsule around uh, the kidney. Uh, if one were to lose a great deal of uh, weight, one of the potential risks is that a kidney could dislodge without this um, fat uh, capsule. Um, so uh, because we build up this toxin in our blood, uh, our abdominal aorta sends renal arteries uh, to uh, the kidneys. So a lot of blood goes to the kidneys and when it returns through renal veins, the goal is that now it has less urea so that the urea gets filtered out of uh, the blood so that uh, blood comes in uh, the renal artery, it leaves uh, the renal vein, um, but while it is in the kidney, it uh, is then processed at these microscopic structures known as nephrons, where the, uh, uh, the urea is, uh, is released. So the uh, kidneys have an outer cortex, an inner medulla, and the nephrons, which are making the urine, um, begin in the cortex, and many then dip down into uh, the uh, medulla. Um, once urine is made in the cortex and the medulla, all it has to do is leave through these spaces, which you know have names, minor calyces, major calyces, and a central renal pelvis before passing into the, um, uh, the ureter and uh, moving then the urine off. Uh, so kidneys are the main organs of the urinary system. It's here that urine is made. Uh, it's here that uh, uh, that uh, hormones can be released, uh, that um, uh, hormones uh, can affect which uh, items are secreted or absorbed uh, into the urine or absorbed into the blood, etc. We have two kidneys, um, and then from each of the kidneys, there are ureters. So we have two ureters, which then transport um, uh, urine to the one single bladder before being eliminated from the one single uh, urethra. Uh, the uh, ureters have the benefit of when we're sitting upright of using gravity, but also they have smooth muscle in their linings. And so um, a wave of muscle contraction known as peristalsis uh, can then help to move the uh, urine uh, towards uh, the bladder. Um, the cells uh, lining the ureters can secrete uh, a, uh, an alkaline uh, mucus, which helps to uh, buffer, uh, given that the uh, urine is urine for uric acid. Uh, urine. Um, the one single uh, bladder that the uh, ureters empty into, they empty into it um, from an angle uh, from uh, beneath. And the reason for that is that as the bladder fills, it closes the openings to the ureters so that urine doesn't back um, up into the, 
in, uh, into, towards the kidneys again. It was uh, the jawed fish. So the jawed fish with the the organisms here is lined by very smooth muscle. And so uh, this allows for uh, reflexes uh, to then allow for the constriction, which um, can eliminate urine and can also then increase pressure, which then increases the, um, uh, the desire to urinate. Um, now, uh, bladders are larger in males than in females. And the common reason for that in mammals is that um, the female pelvis not only has a bladder and a urethra, but it also has a uterus and a vagina, uh, organs lacking in the males. And so the pelvic cavity in females have additional organs lacking in males. And so the bladder is uh, smaller uh, in uh, females as a consequence. Um, uh, there are three openings in the bladder because two ureters enter and one uh, urethra exits. And so then one could draw a triangle, uh, which is known as the trigone, uh, which is uh, you know, the, uh, op uh, the triangular region between the two ureters and the one uh, urethra which exits. Um, the urethra is uh, part of the reproductive system in males in addition to being part of the urinary system. So in males not only is it eliminating urine from the bladder but also since the vas deferens um, sends out an ejaculatory duct in the prostate gland which joins the urethra, semen um, travels through the urethra as well. And so the urethra in males is both part of the urinary and reproductive uh, systems. Uh, in females, it varies. Uh, certainly when we start looking at uh, you know, fish and amphibians, there is you know, a sharing of parts between the urinary and reproductive systems, so much so that we can call it, say, the uh, urogenital um, uh, system. Um, uh, but the, uh, I'm sorry, I just remember something I wanted to say for, about the bladder. Um, and, and so um, in female mammals, uh, it's actually about 50% of mammals still have some fusion of the uh, urethra and the uh, and the vagina, as so that the urinary and reproductive systems are not entirely separate. But in the other half of mammals, they are completely uh, separate. And so there is, um, uh, so there is no connection between the urinary and uh, the reproductive systems uh, in some mammals, including primates, which include humans. So in women, the uh, uh, urethra is 100% a urinary structure, while in men, it is shared between both the urinary and reproductive uh, systems. Uh, the bladder is lined by transitional epithelia, which can stretch, and the urethra then is lined by stratified squamous epithelia uh, with its multiple layers. And that's worth mentioning um, because these uh, cells can sometimes be sloughed off and then can enter the urine. So there can be transitional epithelial cells in urine, which originated from uh, the bladder, or squamous epithelial cells from the, um, uh, the urethra, both of which then are normal. So there are some cells which shouldn't be in urine, like uh, blood cells or uh, red blood cells or white blood cells. Um, but once again, these transitional and squamous epithelial cells, they are normal. Uh, once again, in males, the vas deferens transporting semen forms this ejaculatory duct with, which joins with the uh, urethra. Uh, so the urethra in males can carry both urine and semen. Um, the urethra in males is longer. It goes through the prostate, and we can call this the prostatic urethra, the membranous urethra, and then the penile urethra through the penis. Um, in uh, women, the urethra is much shorter, um, but as a result, it's more easy, it, it's easier for bacteria uh, from the digestive tract uh, to colonize the urethra. Uh, so urinary tract infections are more in, uh, common in women uh, than in men. The longer length of the urethra in males uh, separates it further 
from the source of uh, those microbes. Um, uh, the business end of the urinary system, once again, is the kidneys, because this is where there are microscopic structures known as uh, nephrons. Uh, and the nephrons essentially are the functional unit, uh, so that everything important that happens in the kidney is you know, essentially uh, going on in the nephrons. And the kidneys have a million of these. So in essence, a, uh, a kidney is like a big bag of nephrons. Uh, nephrons have two parts. Uh, the renal corpuscle, uh, which essentially is capillaries in a bag. This is where blood is filtered so that urea can come out. So here's blood coming in to you know, these capillaries. Here's the blood that leaves. And then the goal is that the blood that leaves has less urea than the blood that came in because while here the urea comes out. So one part of the nephron is a bag of capillaries, a renal corpuscle, where blood is filtered. The remaining portion is a renal tubule where a number of things happen. The reabsorption of good stuff so that they're not excreted from the body, but then the secretion of additional waste. And so this uh, renal tubule can be divided into a number of uh, sections. Uh, so uh, if this were a different class, I would go into far greater detail on uh, the nephron. Let me just say a couple final points on it. Um, nephrons do three things. They filter the blood, that's one of them, and this occurs at the renal corpuscle. Once again, blood's coming in blood, uh, through an arterial, uh, it uh, passes through these glomerular capillaries, and then it leaves through an efferent arterial. But while it's here, stuff comes out. This would include uh, urea, the waste that we're trying to get rid of. And so um, this uh, is uh, then surrounded by a bag uh, so that when the filtrate comes out, including the uh, urea, it can then be directed towards the first part of the renal tubule. Now, the reason that stuff comes out uh, is because that the capillaries here are a bit more uh, porous than an average capillary. So capillaries can vary in the size of the spaces that they have. And here at the kidney, they have you know, larger spaces uh, called uh, fenestrations. So these are fenestrated capillaries. And uh, over these capillaries, there are cells of the nephron called foot cells or podocytes that have, um, that form little slits. Uh, and so stuff in the blood comes out of the blood and then enters uh, that capsule. Um, but in order to do that, uh, the, the white cells there with the interdigitating uh, structures a second ago, those were the, the foot cells or the podocytes. Um, uh, size then uh, determines this um, because the blood cells, like the red blood cells, they're just too big to fit through these two holes. The blood proteins are too big uh, to fit through uh, these holes. And so it's only smaller things uh, which can fit through both the fenestration and the filtration slit. Um, and so uh, a lot of stuff comes out. Some of it is good stuff that we want to get back, like water, salt, sugar, uh, like glucose, et cetera. Um, but then uh, urea is included in the substances which then leave. And so thus there is less urea in the blood after passing uh, through uh, the glomerular capillaries because uh, urea leaves here. So uh, in the nephron, uh, the filtering of the blood occurs here at the renal corpuscle. And then two other processes occur along the renal tubule. Uh, the reabsorption of good stuff. All right, so here are renal corpuscles. Those are the capillaries uh, of, uh, surrounded by you know, a capsule. And this is where uh, filtrate comes out, including urea. So here's, there's blood here. There's urea in this blood, but it comes out in this place and, and goes in this capsular space and can be then left. And when you look at a kidney under the microscope, here are those renal corpuscles. Uh, the rest is what we call renal tubules, and it is here that good stuff can be reabsorbed. So water, salt, uh, amino acids, glucose can uh, be reabsorbed. Um, and then additional waste can be uh, secreted uh, along here. So we can get rid of you know, excess potassium, some ammonium, um, and then also uh, acid if we choose. And so here you can see these long uh, renal uh, tubules 
um, especially you know what are called loops of, N, of Henle, which dip down into the medulla of the kidney and help us to concentrate our uh, urine reabsorbing water and salt. Okay. Uh, and so uh, the uh, nephrons have those two parts, the renal corpuscle where we filter blood and then the renal tubule where we reabsorb uh, the good stuff back into the blood and then um, let me pause. And then secrete additional waste. So um, when there's uh, when we filter our blood, good stuff comes out like sugar. Now we don't want to flush sugar down the uh, toilet. We want to use it, you know, to get energy. So we try to reabsorb that along the renal tubule. However, there are um, maximums that we can reabsorb. We can only reabsorb so much sugar. Uh, so for example, in a diabetic, if the blood sugar is really high, that means the sugar in the filtrate is really high and that these pumps, uh, while they reabsorb sugar as fast as they can, they just can't get it all. Uh, some of it would then be lost uh, and um, put into the urine. Uh, so then as I'm gonna mention presently, um, urine analysis uh, can then uh, show uh, a number of physiological uh, conditions uh, because there are things which normally aren't present uh, in uh, urine. Um, when we reabsorb the good stuff, uh, some of this we have no choice in. Uh, it always happens. So in that loop of Henle, we are always absorbing uh, salt and uh, water. Um, and the reason uh, that you know we're good at living on, on land is we have this loop of Henle which allows us to reabsorb water and salt and thus concentrate our urine and this dips down into that uh, medulla uh, section. Um, so this is uh, always occurring but in the final parts of the nephron hormones have a role so that we can change our urine based on our physiological conditions. So for example um, the hormone ADH made by the hypothalamus and secreted from the posterior pituitary. Uh, this can cause us to reabsorb water and concentrate urine. So if we don't make ADH, we make a dilute urine and this helps us get rid of excess water. But if we're dehydrated, then we make ADH and then, um, uh, then we concentrate our urine. And so while some of the urine production uh, is automatic, it's obligatory, uh, obligatory uh, some of it uh, depends on what hormones our body uh, decides to make. By making different levels of ADH, we can change how concentrated our urine is. Another hormone, aldosterone, allows us to change how much salt or sodium there is in our, uh, uh, in our urine. So if we, the more aldosterone we make, the more sodium we retain back in our blood, but the more potassium we excrete as uh, a waste. Another waste which we can get rid of in our kidneys, and this is very important, is acid. Uh, so uh, we can excrete acid uh, when, um, uh, when we need to. Uh, and this is a, a major way of, uh, of fighting uh, acidosis in our bodies. Um, so then finally, uh, there are you know, things which are going to be in urine. So there's going to be water, there's going to be urea, there may be transitional epithelial cells or uh, squamous epithelial cells from the bladder and the urethra. Um, but then there are things which shouldn't be in, in urine. I'm sorry, I thought I had the next video. But then there are things which shouldn't be in urine under uh, normal conditions. Um, so urine, obviously, it's a waste. It's going to be flushed down the toilet. Um, but it has, uh, it has just come from inside your body or your patient's body. And so it carries information, valuable information about what's going on inside your body. And so it's just this wonderful non-invasive way of, uh, you, know, you know, determining some uh, health aspects of your, uh, you know, of your body or your patient. Uh, and so there are a number of urine analysis tests which can be done to look for things which should not be there, like glucose, bilirubin, et cetera. So bilirubin shouldn't be in uh, urine. Bilirubin should be something that the liver cells are making that goes into bile and then released in, uh, to bile ducts into um, the small intestine. Um, but if liver cells are dying for whatever reason, you know, uh, cirrhosis, hepatitis, 
uh, then bilirubin can now be in uh, your urine. So uh, doing a urine test can tell you something about how the liver is uh, working. Um, the presence of nitrites or the presence of white blood cells uh, can indicate a urinary tract uh, infection, uh, which um, is important and uh, is a problem for uh, women uh, more so uh, than uh, men. Um, once again, here, transitional epithelial cells and squamous epithelial cells, um, they uh, are normal components of, um, uh, of uh, urine, as would things like uh, urea uh, be. Um, now, everyone has glucose in their blood and everyone has glucose in their filtrate, but most people then reabsorb the uh, glucose. Um, but as I had said, if you have... Um, uh, uh, if uh, you have diabetes, your elevated um, blood glucose means that you're likely then uh, to uh, have glucose in uh, your urine. Um, there is another diagnostic which helps with diabetes diagnosis, not just glucose. So this would be the positive test for glucose as opposed to negative. But you would also want to look for ketones. Now, all of us will put ketones into our blood tonight when we sleep because the liver will break down fatty acids into these ketone bodies, um, which uh, can be used as an energy source uh, during the night when it's been a while since we've eaten. If we're fasting, if we're starving, um, then we might have higher levels of ketones in our blood, but all of us might have, you know, maybe trace ketones come morning. Um, but one of the, you know, the, the real diagnostics of diabetes is that glucose in your blood or in your urine means that you're very well nourished. You've, you've got plenty of glucose in your blood. Ketones in your um, blood mean that you're starving. So it's odd to have both of these at the same time, glucose and ketones. And the reason is, while if I'm a diabetic, if I've just eaten a meal, I have sugar in my blood, but if I can't make insulin, or if my cells aren't listening to the messages insulin uh, sends, and that's the difference, say, between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, then um, my body thinks it's starving even when uh, it's not. And so those two things together, uh, glucose and ketones in uh, the uh, urine, uh, they would be signs of diabetes. And then there are other tests. So for example, uh, that uh, filtration membrane that I had mentioned, um, uh, red blood cells and proteins should not be able to fit through these holes, all right? So the big stuff should stay in the blood. But if I hurt myself, like if I have a fall, you know, if I have an injury, if I get punched, you know, in the lower abdomen, if I've been exposed to heavy metals, if this is damaged, now blood cells or blood proteins might be able to escape and then might be present in, um, uh, in a urine. Um, so once again, um, uh, urine has just come from inside somebody's body. And as a result, it carries information, which might be useful in diagnosing um, uh, you know, certain uh, conditions. Uh, other things you might look for uh, is uh, just how concentrated the urine is. Now, uh, all of us can make both concentrated and dilute urine, um, but if it's always one extreme or the other, that might draw attention. So if it's always concentrated, well, you're dehydrated, you might be increasing your risk of kidney stones, so you should drink more water. Um, if it's always dilute, you might have a different form of diabetes, not diabetes mellitus, which causes sugar in the urine, but rather diabetes insipidus, because you can't make that hormone ADH, which allows you to concentrate your urine. And if you can't concentrate your urine, you're always uh, releasing a higher volume of dilute urine. So you might wanna look at that. And in the same way, um, the pH of uh, urine, uh, when needed, we can put acid into our urine and thus eliminate it from our body. But once again, you might wanna see if it's always one extreme or another. Um, so this was uh, just some uh, quick uh, information about uh, you know, an overview of the urinary system and some of the diagnostics. Uh, which you know you whether you're for caring for yourself or for a loved one uh, might uh, use to make informed health decisions um, uh, you know for you know you or, or a loved one